Young Muslim Rebels, welcome. My regular viewers will be aware that I'm somewhat preoccupied with, and I can't say the word I don't think, but sea theories. Not because I necessarily believe them. Although I've always argued that what better way to hide a real sea than in a, than in a sea of seas. No, I'm more interested in who is spreading these sea theories and why, what is their motivation for doing so. Uh, so in this vlog I'm exploring my latest thoughts based on my research and indeed experience on the rather dark aspects of sea theories which is leading to the potential radicalisation of young Muslims of the diasporas. I hasten to add that whilst I've researched this vlog, it is a very personal commentary. And the last thing I want to do is start and perpetuate a sea theory of my own. Sea theories. Uh, many of you will know that I'm something of a social media virgin. I've never had a Facebook account. I don't use other social media, but I've had a LinkedIn account for many, many years indeed, shortly after it started, although I hardly use it. My real exposure to social media is through this very platform. Uh, living in Indonesia with limited Bahasa to enjoy local TV. Uh, although I have to say I'm uninterested in game shows, Sinetron, Indonesian soap opera, and political opinion which blames all the problems of Indonesia on foreigners. So I've turned to YouTube initially as a viewer before I became a content creator myself. Like so many, I was immediately drawn to what David Icke had to say, and this led me to Sean Atwoods, whom I'm sure I knew when I used to go out raving in Manchester, and I've got a lot of time for Sean. Sure. Well, I, to a certain degree, I do for David Icke. And I certainly don't want to speak ill of either David Icke or Sean Atwood. Both clearly know how, although both clearly know how to manipulate this new media. Furthermore, while both have, both have introduced me to certain sea theories, both, I believe, are themselves victims of falling for sea theories. As something of a revelation occurred when I was recommended vlogs by this platform on Q, and I don't think I can say it, but you know the rest, non I was frankly gobsmacked while dubious. Although I have to say that I, I was somewhat taken in. Of course, when their predictions, of which there were many, failed to materialise, I became very sceptical indeed. And nevertheless, I, I became transfixed by the whole phenomenon, which I, I guess was the point. And now, looking back on it, it would seem that this phenomenon is simply driven by greed. After all, fake news is more popular than the mainstream media, and it's a very good way of creating income streams, although these are being restricted now, as we know. Uh, despite the evidence that QAnon is simply an example of uninhibited market forces, it's also been claimed that this is a manipulation by outside forces, e.g. an overseas government. Certainly I'm aware that social media is used by political interests, both home and overseas, to spread theories which support their causes. I constantly come across stories which are obviously planted by PR agencies and they're being paid to do so by their political masters. So I don't want to discount that many sea theories begin with political interests. Indeed, it seems to me that many are so well funded that they're unlikely to originate with unattached individuals acting at their own behest. Although, although some may well be, I'm, I'm not discounting it. 
In summary, I'm sure that some theor sea theories are driven by simple, uninhibited market forces. But others I do believe to be politically motivated. Uh, the great concern is that I have, like all social media, that it's creating and supporting narcissistic behaviour, particularly amongst the long, uh, which is leading to the enormous tribalism and hatred uh, that is so evident in, within modern society. Islamic social media. Through this platform I've kept coming across Islamic channels purportedly showing Islamic black magic. I have to say I was always sceptical of some of the practices shown such as defamation of the scriptures and particularly placing Al-Quran in sewers. The summoning of jinn using wafak or tawis or magic squares. Incorporating images of jinn on sajadas or prayer mats. I mean, I explore this further in Sham, my vlog Shams al Marath, the most dangerous book in the world, if you want to look at it further. But let me just say I'm very sceptical of them. Uh, largely because they're completely outside of my experience of practice in the Islamic world. Many of those showing such practice appear to be believable even well-meaning. And the same is true of, of an increasing number of shorts on this platform. There's so many attractive American women wearing jilbabs or hijabs describing Muslim practices that are far from being universal. Indeed, many are only practiced by a minority of Muslims. Uh, but what disturbs me about them is that they're always portrayed as mainstream in Islam, practiced by the majority, and with such attractive women seeming so earnest, who could doubt them? Now, as I began to post comments on vlogs related to Islam, and received responses and comments on my own channel, a by concerned Muslim often wanting to save my soul from going to hell. Uh, the vast, although the vast majority of these comments were hostile and somewhat aggressive. Complete strangers were judging and condemning me, who knew very, very little about me. However, a few did attempt to befriend me, and their line was always the same. They would tell me that they used to think like me, uh, but they've now reformed. But it was always the same line. Always it was based on the assumption that I myself knew very little about Islam and that I needed to be taught the true path. Now at first I sort of accepted this because, you know, I wasn't born into Muslim Islam, I'm a convert. <coughs> and, you know, none of us know the contents of Al-Quran that well. In fact, Al-Quran is in Arabic, and my Arabic isn't good enough to know it that well. Uh, but as I've developed in my own confidence and knowledge of Islam, I smell a rat. You see, Islam's a broad masjid or mosque, and traditionally welcomed and debated all opinions. Furthermore, these people always portray themselves as holding majority views within Islam. Uh, many believe or suggest that I belong to some sort of minority sect. But I'm a Sunni as they are. Even though I'm happy to play with, pray with Muslims, all Muslims, and deplore any form of tribalism within the religion itself. As the patterns began to emerge, it became very apparent to me that they were following tried and tested tactics and arguments. Rather like a salesperson who's trained to handle objections, as though there's a book for showing people the right path and it says, if they say this, quote this bit of al -Quran, say this, say that, you know. It really does feel like it's scripted which leads me to believe that such interactions 
are a part of a well orchestrated and I believe somewhat dark movement within Islam itself. Shams al Marif. I became interested in Shams al Marif after listening to What Magic Is This? The Shams al Marif with Amina Inoles and uh, Jay Ham Ham Hamadi. Of course, I was already aware of the book and of some of its contents, uh, but this vlog really made me start thinking about its importance. My initial vlog on Shams al Marif was, or the son of Gnosis, Shams al Marif, quickly became very popular on this vlog, uh, uh, on this channel. In fact, my most popular vlog. Uh, like the sea theorists that I have criticised, I've followed market forces and have gone on to record many vlogs on Shams al-Marif. Uh, and whilst I would never claim to be an expert on it, I am learning more and more. And the more I learn, the more sort of concerned I become. In publishing these vlogs, it's brought much criticism, or quite a bit of criticism, on my channel. Uh, the claim is that it's here, even to read Shams al-Marif, uh, that Sahia is simply translated to mean magic, even though this is definitely a mistranslation of the old Arabic. Uh, but the strangest logic is that Sahia um, equals shirk, uh, which means polytheism. And whilst I can understand how you could come up with an argument that Sahia equals shirk, uh, that argument is never given. There's never, never any argument given why Sahia equals shirk. Um, Always those arguing with me claim to be coming from the mainstream majority within Islam. Uh, the implication being that I must be from some minority. Uh, because I even even talk about Shams al-Marif. Uh, but you know, Shams al-Marif is taught even in some Islamic boarding schools in Indonesia. Uh, which as many of you will know, is actually the largest Muslim country in the world. So, as a result of the, all of this, I, I, I thought, well, I've got to explore these criticisms somewhat further. And now, I, I don't want to completely rubbish these opinions, not least as to do so would be against my faith. In other words, that I, I shouldn't be criticising other Muslims nor their paths. Uh, but for me, Islam encourages us all to explore knowledge, of which magic is most certainly a part. Furthermore, Sahir really means the practice of black magic. Now, I'm not trying to define and mistranslate Sahir, uh, but uh, there's far more evidence that it means black magic rather than magic as a whole. Uh, this ne this de definition of which does not lend its uh, does not lend itself to a misinterpretation of Al Quran or Hadith. Um, indeed, indeed, the actual definition of what is black magic is a very personal thing, and it forms a part of my daily jihad. Now. As Shams al-Marif ex explains Islamic science of using the 99 names of Allah to get closer to Allah, it's actually a very important religious text to Sufi and Shia Muslims. Indeed, most Sufis don't really belong to a defined Sufi, Sufi school. And many, such as Muslims in Indonesia, don't even recognise Sufism as a sect and simply describe themselves as Muslim. Although the majority of us, as I've said, would describe ourselves as Sunni. So, what I began to realise was that the criticism of Shams al-Marif is a very sophisticated attack 
are what is certainly a significant minority, if not a majority of Muslims. Indeed, the whole thing feels more like an Islamic satanic panic. That such argument, arguments could be used to justify mass murder and attempted genocide of fellow Muslims, one could even see it as a form of Islamic Spanish Inquisition. Now, what's especially worrying about this is those groups who are targeted through this logic would form what in the West as, are described as moderate Muslims. Now, I, I don't accept that term, moderate Muslims, but, you know, they are what in the West would be seen as moderate. Radicalism. Now, let me be clear, I am a Muslim convert. And many Muslims would use the word revert. But I purposely chose not to use that word, as I'm suspicious that it's a part of the very hegemony that I'm criticising. In other words, the revert means that I, we were always Muslim and we were just reverting to it. Well, that seems to be setting us up in some sort of tribalism against other religions, including my former Christian religion. And I don't accept that tribalism. Yes, I was something of a Christian, although very much lapsed. And I've thrown God again through Islam. But it does mean that when I'm near a church, I will pray in a church. Um, so, you know, finding God through Islam has made me embrace all religions, not become tribal against others. And that is at the heart of what Islam means to me. And, you know, I've only been practicing a practicing Muslim for some 12 years now. But I am very devout. I am very devout. I take my obligations very seriously. Now, before my conversion, when I was still living in the UK, I used to do some work on behalf of the British Home Office's Prevent Scheme aimed at reducing radicalism in the UK. Now, at the time, I was sort of perplexed. I couldn't really get to the bottom of what was happening. I couldn't really understand it. It was clear to me that young Bus Muslims of the di diaspora had absolutely nothing in common with their parents. A good many had turned to drugs and street crime, now, there's an even bigger story behind this, especially in the north of England, uh, which I don't intend to repeat here. Uh, but let me just say that what, I'm, what I've just told you is, is an oversimplified version. Uh, you know, it is much more complicated than, than simply the young had turned to drugs and street crime. Uh, the older people saw a commitment to Islam and in particular to, 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 to Salafism or to Bligi Jumat, which most of them were, as the solution to the problems of their young, arguing that their children knew very little of Islam had lost, and had lost their way. And, you know, there was substantial evidence to support that view. So I, I'm, not, I'm not arguing against that view, certainly. It was also apparent that these were... These very young were the very young people that were also being radicalised, often via the internet and now via social media. Um, you could say they moved from being rebels without a cause to rebels with a cause. In part, maybe like me, they were aware of the inconsistencies within the official narratives, which seemed intent on demonising. Muslims, and so their reaction of a stronger Muslim identity, albeit a warped Muslim identity, uh, was a reaction to the fact that they were feeling like victims in every way. And of course, that victimization certainly played into the discrimination, the, the real discrimination that they felt. 
And mixed with this enormous sense of entitlement that exists amongst the young, especially the social media generation. Now, just recently, I looked into the YouTube subscriptions of someone who was attacking me on YouTube. The fact that he addressed me as bro, I knew that he was young and almost certainly living in the West. It turned out actually in the United States. And I looked at his subscriptions on YouTube and they were of firebrand ustads but included some of those very channels that I mentioned earlier containing what I believe to be staged Islamic magic. The penny dropped. These very channels are promoting what I believe to be an attempt to attack Sufis and Shias. Uh, but I've also come across posts uh, which I think could be much darker, aimed at recruiting potential radicals via these and, and indeed other channels. And this all brings me back to the beginning. Are these simply individual Muslims with strong views? And some undoubtedly are, because of, you know, once you start a sea theory if you like or once you start something like this it has a momentum of its own, own. Uh, but are there some darker forces behind some of these channels certainly I've come across bots express in the most rabid extremist Islamic views on this platform now they're bots so, you know, they, they might simply have learnt it, learnt this from other people. But you have to question, where is the origin of these bots? Now, I have my own suspicions, but I don't want to create yet another sea theory. I do, however, ask you to ask yourself, in whose interest is it to divide the Muslim community in this way? But furthermore... Are these the very same interests dividing the United States, indeed the Western world? Or can we simply write it off as individuals led by greed, as we're asked to believe? Well, I really hope you've enjoyed this vlog. And if you have, can you help me out a little? Subscribe to the channel, hit the bell and then you'll be notified of future vlogs. But also hit the like button and make a comment. Uh, because these seem to be what determine the um, YouTube algorithm and I I'm being really punished by it. So whatever help I can get from you is, is so appreciated, it really is. I'm, uh, when I started this, I was going to do it uh, this, this section. The real magic of Java I was going to issue maybe t every two, three months. Now it's, it's happening maybe every two or three days. So yeah, if you hit the bell, you'll hear about it. Um, and thank you so much. Thank you for listening. Really heartfelt thanks.